Welcome to another edition of Ben Creek Podcast. Ryan Ray alongside Dr. Energy herself, Ellen Wald. Ellen, how's it going? Everything is great, and I am super excited for our big interview today. Yes, we have on Commissioner Christy Craddock, and so we are not going to do, normally we do our interviews at the back half of the show, but due to her schedule, we wanted to accommodate. She will be at the beginning of the show, so we will go ahead and hop to that right now. And up next is joining us from the Texas Railroad Commission, Commissioner Christy Craddock. Commissioner Craddock, uh, this is for the listener's vantage point. Uh, May the 4th, so all the Star Wars nerds out there, may the 4th be with you. How's your day going? My day is good, and may the 4th be with you, too. I saw that last <laughs> night. I was watching a few Star Wars, so one of my favorite things. <laughs> so by the time this goes live, which will be Tuesday, so tomorrow, May the 5th, um, we're not sure what will all happen, but this morning we, we invited you on in anticipation of tomorrow's meeting. Uh, this morning, Commissioner Sitton went on, I believe, Bloomberg and said that there will be no vote for prorationing. Can you kind of get us up to speed as it stands on 1 o'clock on May the 4th so we can kind of at least get a time capsule for this conversation? Well, we do have – the Railroad Commission does have a meeting in the morning at 9.30, and so – we are going to, again, take up as an agenda item proration and the issues surrounding proration. Um, Commissioner Sitton got up and, and was on earlier today on whatever he said. But let me say, from my perspective, it'll be the first vote we will, we will take on this issue. It has been important, in my opinion, to have a lot of conversation and debate. We've only been talking about this for the first time in 50 years, only for six weeks. And it's been important to, uh, for me to get a lot of information. And so we've done that. And I think that you will see us continue to have that conversation. But look, I, based on the information we have today, and frankly, how fast the market has moved in the last six weeks, I think you will see us not do prorationing tomorrow. I think you've got two, one commissioner has come, came out last week. Another commissioner came out, I guess, this morning. Um, and, and that's been the uh, the direction that I've uh, gone as far as uh, where we're going to be tomorrow. That's going to be my vote is not to take any operation. I think it doesn't make a lot of sense with how fast the market's moved. And, and I think it's been important for us to have this conversation. Though. Yeah. One of the things that I found interesting about the last call on your position, at least, was you referenced um, that you're a, a lawyer and kind of have a legal background and you talked about um, the potential litigation aspects and you mentioned requesting, I believe, the attorney general to weigh in. Can you update us on uh, we kind of speculated some ideas of what could happen, but um, can you update us on those conversations or what you found out or some of the obstacles that maybe would come into play if if the motion theoretically were to pass? Sure. Look, be, have, being being uh, lawsuit proof, I think, has been an important thing because if this goes to court, it doesn't help anybody anyway. Our, our general counsel has been very thoughtful in giving us advice. They've reached out and had several conversations with the Texas Attorney General's office, which we appreciate. Uh, they have given us some uh, some legal advice, which we'll talk about a little bit tomorrow. And, you know, good or bad, we at least have some good direction if we decided to go down this road. Obviously, the definition of waste, I think you'll see, is is up to us as commissioners, but at least process and how we would have a good hearing what we would do and what we would need in that in those data points have have been discussed and I appreciate that that's part of what I think as a prudent regulator we need to know the answers to so we'll have some of those conversations again tomorrow and I appreciate that the AG's given us some direction because like I said nobody's done it in 50 years so we didn't know and I think that's been important for all of us to understand Hi, uh, Commissioner Craddock. This is uh, Ellen Wald. And um, I, I listened with, with great interest to the uh, hearing uh, a little while back uh, and a lot of the um, producers that were, were weighing in and, and their various concerns. And one of the themes I saw expressed was really very much like, how do we do this since this isn't something that the Texas Railroad Commission has done for a long time. And uh, I'm, I'm actually a historian by training, and, and I've studied some of the um, historical um, actions of the Texas Railroad Commission, particularly in how the, the commission was kind of a, a blueprint 
or roadmap for OPEC. Uh, but I was curious to know if um, what role history or uh, the the historical actions of the Texas Railroad Commission played in the way that uh, you and perhaps the other uh, commissioners went about, you know, examining the situation now? Were there any particular historical events that informed your thinking on this? Well, so I've done a lot of history research, too, in the past few weeks, and I feel like that's what I've spent a lot of time on is understanding what we used to do. So I I say 50 years, it's been 1973. So I looked for any 80 plus year old that I could find. I do not mean that disparagingly, but they're the last ones who did it for us as an agency and were around. And several people I finally found have um, done progressioning for us in this in the early 70s and late 60s about how we did it. Um, and things have changed. And that's where I think from 1973 going forward, we now have the Administrative Procedures Act, which we didn't used to have, which is process and procedure for us. But also, frankly, the market's changed, in my opinion. If you go back to the 70s and you look at where Texas was and maybe Oklahoma and a handful of other states, we were the U.S. market. Now with opening the, and we are now selling products from Texas all over the world, both liquid natural gas and oil, both refined products and unrefined, that wasn't going on in the 70s. So we don't have a, what used to be that uh, people who were buying the products came in and told us what the market was. Well, I'm not sure how we would do that today. So that's very different today. We have operators coming in and asking us to do things, but not really the marketplace. We would have to, we we thought, figure out how to make a market and know what the market looked like. And that's very, very different from what we used to do. And I think that's one of the challenges and why that's made that this is so difficult. The market's different depending on where you are across not just the country, but across the state. And so that would be a real challenge uh, in my, one of the challenges in my opinion. And uh, just to, to kind of continue along with, with that, um, it seems like that was definitely something that was expressed in terms of, well, if Texas does this, where does that leave Texas in um, comparison to other states like Oklahoma and, and even perhaps North Dakota? Um, can you maybe comment on any, um, any – do you see the Texas Railroad Commission in some ways as uh, setting an example for other states? Um, how have you spoken with any of the regulators in other uh, oil producers? Producing states and, and how does that work? So I think all of us have had conversations with other oil producing states, and I've actually been on the phone twice or three times now with Canada. So we've had conversations amongst all the larger operators and and uh, companies and states, and frankly, the federal government's the second largest producer when you look at EIA numbers in the country. So we've had conversations also with Department of Energy about what you do. And I I think one of the things that we all believe and what I think has really been important is that Texas shouldn't go it alone, but we need to do it with other states. Look, our biggest challenge that we don't want to do as a regulator is disadvantage Texas over other markets. And so when you've got, when you really don't have other states or other groups moving that same direction, and I think it's hard to get us all to move in the same direction at the same time, then then it didn't end up making a lot of sense, in my opinion. I've okay, got one, one more question, Ryan. Um, and so um, kind of looking out then, so you've said that you talked with Canada and, and with federal government and other, other aspects. What about even looking at the, the larger picture? I mean, Texas, you know, if you were to rank Texas in, you know, the um, – uh, all of it, if you were to, to take it as an oil producing state, I think it's one of the largest oil producing, it, it would be one of the largest oil producing countries in the world. How do you see um, the Texas Road Commission and, and your um, your kind of regulatory authority in the larger global picture, um, particularly when it certainly seems like organizations like OPEC are watching very carefully to see uh, what's going on in Texas. Do you see it as kind of setting an example or uh, maybe communicating a message in some way? Um, what's, what's going on there? Well, I think first and foremost, what the Railroad Commission has always done, and I I say in Texas, it's the most important agency in the entire state because the oil and gas is so important, not just to Texas, but to the economy in Texas and worldwide. But but where I think the Railroad Commission has done a good job 
not just in the short term, but historically, it's providing regulatory certainty. And so, and not picking winners or losers, but we historically have allowed the market to take care of itself. And in this case, it seems to me the market corrected itself with conversation. And clearly, this has been part of the conversation, but the market is correcting itself. We're seeing it on earnings calls that companies are cutting CapEx. We're seeing um, conversations that companies are cutting uh, well products, wells. Our, look, our, our permits are off 60% in a month. So clearly the market is correcting itself. And, uh, and that's part of where I think a regulatory body sometimes has to step back, watch what the market does. And then if it's not correcting itself or doing going the right direction that we want to make sure that we're engaged. But I think the conversation about how important oil is and how important it is, it is across the world is, uh, has been, has been a nice conversation, but until we all get back to work and start using more oil and the demand side goes up, I think there's, that's the going to be the most important thing long-term for this industry. One of the things I've made my position pretty clear everywhere I've talked about it, I'm not in favor of the prorationing, but let's just kind of talk through some of the, the, the problems that I would see with something like this. And um, from your perspective, how y'all looked at these, um, if you go back to, I think a couple of calls ago, when y'all had like, you know, 13 hours of, <laughs> of interviews. Um, some of the problems that were presented that folks that were in favor of the motion, it seemed that um, even passing this measure could not guarantee that it would actually solve their unique problems. So you, so how did you guys think about that, weighing that into it? You know, um, you know, a producer has this problem and this this measure may not pass it. And on the flip side, what I propose as well is um, these companies, especially the majors and large companies, have you know teams of lawyers who will try to you know navigate around whatever regulatory you know measure you pass to try to make sure that they can um, you know do whatever they want to do um, by using you know legal words and stuff like that. We see that all the time. So walk me through maybe both sides of that of that coin and say, okay, well, you know, how did y'all think about that? How did you evaluate that? Or did you go, you know, this these are the types of reasons we don't want to be in favor of these motions? Well, first and foremost, I think from a commission perspective, we want to make sure this industry is still around and we want to make sure that people have jobs. And that has been a priority, large or small, doesn't matter the size of the company. And so Where I started in looking at the process was where there are rules and regulations that we could waive, give people extra time to comply with without affecting the environment and make sure people are still around first and foremost. So that that was and that I think has been the basics for any anything that we've done is figuring out how we make sure this industry is still around and still vibrant and that we're protecting jobs across the state where I think one of the biggest questions I've had, and I finally had a gentleman answer it to me this past week was this, you bring up how does it really protect somebody? And I think some people thought we would put a floor potentially on the price of oil. I never was convinced of that because I think that Texas is what 4 million barrels of oil or it was. I think we've cut probably a million barrels would be the rough estimate today that we know of and probably more than that. But we are, we've seen that much oil cut in the past month, we think based on reports. But I, you know, I think one of the challenge, one of the, one of the questions I've had is I don't want to prevent somebody from recovery for beginning to continue to drill and have recovery. And I don't want to disadvantage anybody. So I've asked the question several times. We go back to a, the proposed order, for instance, we're going to do your production numbers on December 2019 and we're going mm-hmm. to cut 20%. Well, the market's already, and you, if you're smart in the market, you're already cutting that. Tw- you've already cut yourself. And then mm-hmm. we're going to catch you 20% again. I had somebody finally email us yesterday and say, look, you're disadvantaging me. I'm still in the marketplace. I'm a small operator, by the way. I'm still in the marketplace. I see opportunity in the marketplace. And you're going to, and I've already cut, I've already cut almost 60%, but I'm still in the market. And you're going to make me cut another 20% on top of what I've already cut. That doesn't may have been, I'm out of the market completely. And so I think that's been one of the challenges is is figuring out how a real cut would help people when, to me, you'd cut them again. Plus, I think when you've heard from people 
in the market, say pipelines and, and the, the downstream people, they see opportunities. I had two phone calls in the past week, which amazed me. And they said, real time, physical demand in the market. We all look, we all, historically, we also go negative and we, I mean, it, it was mass panic in the industry and totally unexpected, I think, generally. So we, but people have called me since and they said, here's what's happening in the physical demand in the market. We've looked at our wells and we're not going to complete anything for the month of May or June because we don't think that makes economic sense for us. That's what they should be doing. We've got to look at that. But they said, we still have contracts that we have to fulfill for the oil we were supposed to get. Okay. They went out to buy it on the open market. Two different companies tell me this. There was no physical market available, oil market available for the month of May. It was already shut down or committed. So I think there are some opportunities. There's pipeline capacity we know. People are still, you may not like the prices of anything, but you've seen, uh, obviously, refineries are going full on because they see an opportunity. And Asia is opening back up and there are people selling their product overseas. So I think there's some opportunity for people that they may or may not have realized even six weeks ago. One of the um, the things that I was concerned about was, um, you know, it always goes back to, uh, the, the citizens' rights, and so how would this cut if um, dealt with? You know, mineral owners who, um, you know, because uh, there was I know one gentleman who petitioned or ma- made request that you guys uh, petitioned the, the Texas government to uh, the, the governor, whoever it was, to in- enforce that they wouldn't lose their leases. And to me, that seemed kind of a, a, a scary proposition to say that we're asking you guys to cut and we're asking you guys to hold our leases in place. I know the Texas, I believe Texas State Land has come out and said that they can. They were willing to negotiate for uh, producers to not produce, but also hold their leases. Um, what can you tell us about some of the potential problems that that would have caused if uh, if, if a prohibition were to go forward? So I think one of the things you, that companies have looked for is why, to get out of leases to re, or readjust their leases. I think that's one of the challenges right now. What we're hearing from from companies as well as landowners is that most companies are coming back in. Mineral owners don't want you to, to drill in today's market. They, they're they getting, you know, $40, $50. They don't want you to drill at $20 a barrel or 12 or whatever the number might be. They like you to wait and drill. So what companies are doing is they're back out renegotiating with their landowners, with their mineral owners, having those conversations. I think overall, a bunch of those mineral owners are are letting those leases be extended. Um, Maybe not everybody, but I think a bunch of them are if they're smart. Uh, And companies are trying to do that, and that's what they should be doing. That's part of their operations. And and so not just for mineral owners, which, look, mineral owners are the state of Texas too. So we're watching the state of Texas Mm -hmm. bring in less dollars as well. In fact, most states across the country, especially in the Western states, have um, state lands or federal lands. And so those are less dollars bringing in, but it's not just uh, the, the severance tax that we pay, but it's also property taxes, it's sales taxes, and all of those are down in, in Texas. And I would think in other states as well, oil and gas affects everything. So last year in Texas, oil and gas was roughly 35% of the state's economy, but they pay every tax. And they pay severance taxes as well. And those mineral owners get a, get a payment and they pay property taxes as well. So it is a stream that is going to be affected across the board. Um, uh, one, one other uh, thought that I had is, is you talked about the role of, of kind of discourse and discussion and hearing from the different uh, producers, the different companies, the mineral owners. Um, but but one, of, one of the the questions I think that, that needs to be asked is, um, how do you see the role of the Texas Railroad Commission going forward if um, particularly at this, this time, this is probably the greatest challenge to the oil industry that we've seen maybe since, you know, since the 1970s, possibly. Um, I'd like to maybe wait, wait on uh, determining that historically for, for a little while. Um, but uh, what role do you see that the Texas Railroad Commission should uh, continue to play in the future of 
the oil industry and the oil market if um, you know determined that now is not an appropriate time to to do proration uh, because things are, are proceeding as they should. But um, do you see an expanded role for the commission? Uh, what what's 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 the role going forward? Look, I think our role is still important because we are a regulatory body. We have rules that we have in place. Again, we are waiving and or giving people additional opportunities on those rules. But as this in, in the next few months, we still have inspections to do. We found historically that when the industry is uh, down or in a dip, that there are we need to have more inspectors on the ground to make sure there aren't environmental problems, right? We know that we will also inherit and we have a well plugging program in, within the state. We know that we will inherit some wells at, at the state level and we want to make sure we're inspecting those and prioritizing them to be plugged. And then long term for us, look, I think uh, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm looking at what everybody else is looking at to, for the, uh, the future. I think this is hopefully a short term and I say short term in the scheme of things, a year, two years as, as this industry comes back, there's some opportunity, in my opinion, for us to assess all of our rules and regulations, make sure we're in the best possible place we can be, continue to have conversations with not just people in this state, but across the world and across the country to make sure we have best practices in place and be ready for the next piece. Because this industry historically is very resilient. They're very innovative, and we want to make sure that our rules are in place, but that are, we are not preventing innovation, for instance. A lot of people have called us in the last few weeks about storage opportunities and how they want to store more oil. I think that's a great idea. We've got rules in place for oil storage, by the way. So we are going to look at, one, waiving some of those in the short term, but two, we're still enforcing those. And shouldn't we potentially have more oil storage onshore and in Texas, not to compete with, with Cushing, but to be uh, complementary of Cushing. That's an opportunity, I think, that people are looking at. There's a lot of opportunities through innovation that companies are looking at that they, that they want to see in the long term. And I think that's where Texas and or the regulatory world, our certainty is important to, to, for them to know if they're going to do investment for the long term, what our rules are going to be. Okay, I know we are getting up against the clock. Let me just kind of ask this because um, obviously Ellen and I are on the I think the same side of this issue. But um, you know, I do own a service company in that works in the oil and gas business in Texas. Obviously, we've been impacted like everyone else. Uh, a lot of our listeners are frustrated. They're upset. They're hurt. They're mad. That may disagree with Ellen and I, um, and they're, they're you know they'd say, oh, you know, the commission's in in bed with the big shell companies, or they're scared of reelection, or, or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of things obviously going around, no matter what side you're on this debate. Um, this last minute or two, kind of walk through, uh, not not for the other commissioners themselves, but but you just kind of maybe summarize some of those concerns, and and again maybe one final plea for why you think this is the the best way for Texas to move forward. Look, I grew up in Midland, Texas, and so I can tell you that I have a cousin and several friends that have lost their job. If I believed that prorationing would have kept anybody's job, we would have done it, and I would have been on the forefront. Where I think. The Railroad Commission has always done a good job as being consistent with the rules and really looking at what would and would not help people. In my opinion, prorationing wouldn't have helped anybody, not just in the short term, but frankly, in the long term. Look where we were three weeks ago when we had the hearing and look where we've come. The market is taking care of itself, good or bad. And that's there's going to be some tough things happen in this market, but it's already taking care of itself. And I think that's what this economy and this country is about is free market principles. And that's what I've always believed in. Okay. And and then to recap our start of this conversation, as it stands now, it sounds like commissioner Sitton will not put forth the motion, but if he does, you and uh, commissioner Christian are going to oppose that. Is that correct? That's, that's where I am. And I think Wayne has spoken for himself. Yes. It's Wayne has spoken in the Christian Chronicles referring to that as well. Okay. Uh, commissioner Craddock, thank you so much for your time. I think uh, you and your staff getting this together and Nate on our side, uh, this is kind of a short notice deal. I believe Thursday, Friday, Ellen, it kind of came across our, our desk. So uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, willingness to hop on. I know you're busy. Thank you all for taking the time. Be safe. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, well, Ellen, there it is, Commissioner Craddock. What are your thoughts? That was very insightful. I think it gave. Um, 
I don't think that she said anything that I that I didn't expect to hear based on uh, having heard her speak and ask questions at the uh, hearing, the, the first hearing. I, I didn't listen to the second one, but I did listen to quite quite a lot, quite many hours of, of the mm-hmm. first one. And I think that that her her statement today didn't didn't surprise me based on on what she said. Um, I'm really interested. I'd be really interested to hear what she talked about with Canada and, and what Canada <laughs> said. Um, probably she just talked to people in Alberta, not like all of Canada. But um, I think that would, would be really interesting because she seemed very intent on really getting a wide range of um, of input on this. And it would be interesting to hear whether Canada spoke favorably about its, or at least Alberta, about its decision to, to restrict production, mm-hmm. or uh, whether they talked about some of the pitfalls that they faced. Yeah, you know, after the, I watched some of both. So after the last one, my question was, uh, Commissioner Christensen said that uh, North Dakota and Oklahoma were going to be ruling in in meeting and Commissioner Craddock, as I brought up on the interview, talked about the legal aspects. So it, w- it wasn't clear if they were opening the door to follow suit if these um, these obstacles were overcome or if another state jumped in. So Commissioner Christensen could have joined up with North Dakota and Oklahoma uh, and Commissioner Craddock could have said, well, I had these legal questions and now they're answered. Therefore, I'm willing to move. Um, and because of the time lapse and the market response, maybe we don't fully know what would have happened a couple weeks ago. Um, but it, it sounds like, you know, one of the things we've talked about, I know, is is that it's it's just a nightmare to try to pull something like this off. It's not it's not easy. And there there would have been people happy and there would have been people mad. And then people mad would have blamed the Texas Railroad Commission yeah. for putting them out of business. Yeah. This or way, they, this way they have no one to blame but but the market. And because, so. Well, well, and I am sympath- I am sympathetic to the the government is really driving the demand shock or whatever we're calling it now, demand collapse. You know, the government is really the driver um, by their response to the COVID pandemic. Now, maybe you agree with that, maybe you don't, but the, but but regardless, the government is enforcing the, the shutdown, which is driving the the loss of demand. So yeah. I I don't think we should you know radically change policy because of some other policy, but I do understand at least that it is a little different than um, you know the last time when there was just a bunch of oil and. You know, we, we had a bunch of oil producers, you know, and so I, I, but, but that aside, I don't think people would have walked away three months, six months, nine months going, oh, yeah, this, this really worked out great. And so, um, I, I do, I, I don't want to say this. Um, so we had, I think Nate Thursday, Friday, like we said, Nate said that Commissioner Crack was going to come on. Um, and then this morning, Commissioner Sitton announced that there will no longer be a vote. And Ellen, I, we, we hadn't talked about that, obviously, but to me, it seems like based upon his Twitter comments that, He's backing down. Yeah. Like if he really believed in this, then go ahead and push the issue forward. It doesn't feel like his mind's been changed or um, he's gone back to a free market principle type guy. It's, it seems like he's he's like on the Bloomberg, and we'll try to link to that in the show notes if we can. But he's on Bloomberg. You know, first off, it was a staff proposal. It wasn't his proposal, and which I don't know what that even means. Um, and then you know, but. Yeah, I was say if if he if it was a staff, I mean, I think a, a lot of people associated with him because associated with him regardless because he owned it. I mean, he mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. very much out there both on Twitter and talking about like like what can we do and and I get it. He wanted to do something. Like people want to do something when there's a problem. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think as maybe it seems like Chris Craddock was saying, sometimes the best thing to do is not get not get your hands in and mix it up and see what the market is going to do. Um, but I understand that impulse to do something and, and I see it a lot. I'm not saying I support it, but I do understand why people have that, that impulse. And, um, you know, it, it's, it did seem like he was backing away from this proposal. Like it wasn't his proposal of staff, but it, well, okay. Then what would have been your proposal? Right. You know, like if you didn't want to do 20%, what about, did you want to do 10%? Would, I mean, like what, what, what kind of proposal were you looking for? Um, you know, and, and I do think that one of the, one of the things Commissioner Craddock said uh, in, in the discussion was that the market today is, the, the, the industry is very different from the way that it was in the 70s. And it seems like she was trying to say, it's not just in Texas and Oklahoma, it's mm-hmm. 
it's there are a lot of other places where we're doing this. And so it would be even less effectual if Texas did something. I'm not necessarily sure that I buy that argument because Texas, you know, Four million barrels a day. That's that's like a bigger. That's that's on par with Iraq in mm-hmm. terms of an oil producing country. I didn't have the numbers in front of me when I asked that question, but I probably probably should have. But um, so saying that like it's more diffuse in Texas, and you know, and I, I get that argument because it's something that I definitely saw when I was you know reading about the Texas Royal Commission in in historical documents, and there were other attempts to kind of. Co- set collective policy. There's another attempt in American history to try to do this. And the issue, it was like, it didn't work because they just didn't have enough people well, to do the, it. Like, and so she's, like, she's like, Texas isn't big enough to do it on its own. But at the same time, you had Oklahoma and North Dakota, which were basically saying, we're looking to see what Texas does before we right. do anything. Well, you brought up Iraq. And it's funny because we're not going to get into this much today, but I, I did see over the weekend, I believe, that there's a fight in Iraq over... <laughs> Which co- which company Exxon and the other, the other two is going to actually have to bear the brunt of the OPEC cuts there? Oh yeah, when well, this yeah. is a huge issue because there are all these different companies there. Not just that, but but Iraq has got an issue because it's got production in northern Iraq mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. the Kurdish Kurdistan regional government mm-hmm. and southern Iraq and traditionally only, like only three, the, the article I read only mentioned three companies. Is is that right for Iraq? About three to four companies that are producing there? Are we talking in the southern I, in, for the? I, I didn't read the article, so I can't, okay. I can't, say, but I know that there are more companies in, in the, but in addition to this with the, the companies, and I think you're probably right. If you're just looking at oil, I think there are probably three big co- companies producing there right now. Um, but then you've also got the Kurdistan regional government, which kind of sets its own rules and they're constantly fighting with, with Southern Iraq and they're going to fight tooth and nail not to cut. So I would not be surprised yeah, is, if I'll send it to the you. rock this doesn't is, cut. This is from Reuters. Majors such as BP, Exxon, Lucal, and ENI, E-N-I, produced the lion's share of Iraq, Iraq's output. And I don't see anything about where it's at, but I wouldn't really pay attention to the article. Anyways, and the, the point is, is that there's that was, was four companies there, uh, and they're fighting over who has to take the cut and how much they're going to cut and stuff like that. So just start extrapolating that number out to Texas, yeah. where it's orders of magnitude large and you know and so it's not even it's it's not even in exxon mobiles over here too just to be clear so you know if they're not want to cut over there they're not want to cover here probably uh unless, unless they unless they want to cut then they'll cut themselves it's pretty simple um so yeah i think that it, it, it's one of those things that um it sounds like yeah hey we're gonna go here and we're gonna cut and it's gonna work and then you, you realize that okay there's other issues at play and we try to figure out all these issues. We probably can't. And then what, what if we do and the, the, the wording it right? And then uh, it has the wrong impact on the market or there's lawsuits. And then, but you know, it's, it seems like it's a, um, it's a battle that really can't be lost. And I, you know, you're the, you're the historian here. Um, when you look back at the, at the, at, at, at the last time the, the Rebel Commission did this, I mean, would would we say that that was a, a good thing back then, or would you say not, it wasn't really effective, or it ended up being a lot more? It's it's, it's kind of hyped up as something that you know. Sometimes you look back in history like, well, back then they did it, but you know, kind of like the old adage, I walk to school, uh, yeah, up, both, both uphill, yeah, both, both yeah, ways, right, right, right. bare so feet it, in the snow. Yeah, it's something that we kind of we kind of we kind of throw out, but when you go yeah. back and look at the details, it really wasn't that that much impact or that big of a deal. Yeah, so. I'm going to I'm going to not answer that question for 1973 and the 1960s just because I that's not the period that I was focusing on okay. um when I was doing this research I was really most focused on the the 30s and the great depression mm-hmm. and you definitely had a lot of companies like everyone was producing and you had oil that was like selling for like pennies if that mm-hmm. but you also had oil literally sitting in open containers evaporating which mm-hmm. is the definition of waste mm-hmm. forget economic waste they had yeah. physical waste mm-hmm. but um but the real issue that that i thought was was most interesting at that time was that despite the fact that the railroad commission was like guys let's all do this and there were people on board with it it didn't really work like you still mm-hmm. could, there were still people who refused to to comply. And at first it was totally voluntary. They just had to to agree voluntarily. And it wasn't until they had to get, in order to get people to to actually stop producing, they had to 
get the governor of Texas to like declare some sort of state of emergency and then send in the Texas Rangers and the National Guard to enforce it. And even then it wasn't well enforced. It only really managed to get the price of oil up to like, I don't remember exactly. I'd have to look it up, but it, it, it they got it up like a little bit, a, a bit. And so it just said to me that like, that the issue was really that you you can't, you can't try to do something that you can't enforce for so on. It sounds like they have a lot better, you know, ways to enforce. I mean, back then they would have mm-hmm. to like ride out on like horseback right. and like, they're looking for like hot oil and, you know, people yeah. like tapping. Pipelines no drones, pl- uh, satellites, nothing like that. Yeah. yeah so, but, but the issue was less like how to enforce it was that like, they didn't actually have enforcement power. It had always been like a kind of loose confederacy of like producers who all agreed that this was like in their best interest which is like the same as OPEC. I mean, like OPEC doesn't really have any power to enforce. And and I've seen it play out in real time. Like you go to these OPEC meetings and they're like, the worst they can do is they can like bully, you know, the countries that aren't, aren't adhering to like right. get up in the press conference and, you know, beat their chest or something like that. So it, the Texas Railroad Commission, I mean, the enforcement was, they said they were going to fine people a thousand dollars per well, I think. Or something like that. If they didn't comply, so that that was what was at least what was in the 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 um, what um, Sitton says that he was his staff. Was, the staff prepared. <laughs> the staff came up with the that. So that's actual enforcement power. And and one of the other interesting things was at the time, I believe in in the thirties, Oklahoma had a similar commission, but they had given that commission better enforcement powers. And so Oklahoma did it. And once Oklahoma did it, Texas was like, okay, now we'll go along with it. So it's right. really all about the collective and getting everyone together and at least in, in getting it to work. And it did seem to me like she was much more concerned with like, is this going to be effective? Are we going to hurt people? And is the market really taking care of this on its own? And I think that's a major difference between then and now is that there's a lot more. I mean, she says that like production is down a million barrels a day. That's like, almost that that's that's quick i mean that's really fast i know everyone's like oh we wish it was like three weeks ago but the way that it was in was very fast I mean, russia can't or won't or whatever cut that fast right. so it does seem like there is a different way that the the industry can respond now well and, and you know a couple things one you're you're right about the uh about the compliance thing that's a lot of things that people when they went OPEC, they just kind of assume OPEC says, therefore it happens. And that's just not the case. It's almost like Americans forget that governments lie and manipulate and don't follow their own rules. It's, it's really weird, but it happens, folks. It happens. Um, oh, this is, I just saw this from uh, First Squawk. Russian crude oil production virtually unchanged month on month. Well, that's, and, and that's not surprising. So, well, what, okay, what's interesting about that is, first of all, that means that, remember that, that price war that we mm-hmm. were having between mm-hmm. Russia and Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. when Russia was like, oh, we're all going to produce so much in April, and Saudi was like, we're going to produce so much, and guess who produced so much in April? Saudi Arabia, not mm-hmm. Russia. Russia mm-hmm. didn't, the Russia didn't even increase its production from March. So, like, can we, mm-hmm. sorry, guys out there, let's, let's get over the price war narrative. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't mentioned. I was scrolling to my Twitter feed here, and I, I didn't mean to get off. On <laughs> Sorry, no, it's no, like no, a no, personal no, no. thing of mine no. where I just, you know, get annoyed with people who are like the price war, the price war. I'm like, well, like you said, what was it? Fixed, fixed price war. Price war. Yeah. Um, I don't. You, you had some points I was going to respond to. I don't. I don't remember what they were. <laughs> Sorry, I was. I got caught off by that. In that headline. I was like, wait, hold on. Um, at the end of the day, it's uh. Commissioner Craddock said it, and I, I agree with her. Um, I think she's right. It's, we've got to start increasing demand. And, you know, I think right now the market is overly optimistic about what's going to happen. Mm. Um, if you just kind of look at the headlines, uh, and that's what I was kind of scrolling through here, um, you know, as, you know, if we just kind of go back in time, you know, we had, you know, the hospitals were going to be overrun, so we can beat too many deaths, so we shut down. Yeah. Well, now we've been shut down for eight weeks, whatever it is. Um, and now there's been a lot of talk about the potential second wave and, you know, the, you know, the antibodies, right. The, there's a lot of different things that have come out about this, but now as the economy starts to back up, all of a sudden the, the narrative of the second wave is here, um, you know, there's gonna be, the deaths are going to double. And I don't know if that's right or wrong per se, 
But I am not entirely convinced yet that the economy is going to fully open back up because there's going to be a lot of, definitely a lot of pressure from certain parts of the world to keep this thing shut down. And I, I don't mean that geogra- uh, geogra- geographically speaking, like the media or whatnot is mm-hmm. going to be you know, putting out headlines. World Health Organization would put out headlines says, you know, this is what you should be concerned about. So we might not actually be out of the woods on getting back to normal yeah. demand by June. You know, it, it, um, we Definitely. might be in June and back to another shutdown again, which I don't think the economy can stand, uh, but, but it's possible. I think that once you open things back up, you're going to have a really hard time convincing people to then go back. Uh, and I think that, I think you're going to see, you're going to see an increase in demand Mm-hmm. But it's not going to go back to where it was because there are going to be people, and I think it will be interesting to see how many of them there are, but there are absolutely going to be a segment of people who are terrified and who will not leave their homes, even mm-hmm. no matter what, you know, no matter what is open. And then you also have a segment of the population that is like, I had enough of this. I mean, you're already seeing, right. every, like, I had enough of this. I'm going about my life now and, you know whatever. So the, the the question I think for demand is which which population is going to overwhelm right. is going to end up being larger than the other. And I think we're going to see some really interesting um, divergences in terms of states, particularly mm-hmm. certain states, you know, have extended their lockdown. Like I think Oregon extended no, it through like well, July. July the governor is out there just debone folks. Yeah. Santos um, Santos is out there laying the wood to folks. Did you see his press conference? Uh, I saw the, I, I listened. Okay. So funny story. Um, I listened to part of his press conference with the president on the radio because I was trying to go to the beach, except only to discover that the beach that I like to go to is still closed because it happens to be a state park and state beaches Uh-oh. are closed. So he turned around and came home, but I did get to listen to it. And he was like laying into people. He was like, yeah. look, our cases all came from New York. They didn't come from abroad and we took care of it. Like we were expecting this and this and this. And now we have all these extra ventilators we want to get rid of. And like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm never particularly impressed with Ron DeSantis, um, mostly because, like, I can say I knew him when he was like a first-term <laughs> congressman from the district right, you know, south of mine, and I was not particularly impressed with him. <laughs> and first impressions, I think, tend to stick, and I'm still not very impressed with him. But I did think that he he had a good. He he did explain things. And yeah, I just I, yeah I'm not right. weighing in on whether or not he's a, a good governor. I just found it funny that he was pulling out projections from newspaper, you know, 300,000 cases or whatever it was, you know, actual cases, projected deaths, actual deaths. And he just kind of went back oh. and forth with, with the, oh, yeah. and, 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 you know, and obviously we can talk about, I don't know how uh, restrictive the, um, the, uh, the, the, the rules were in Florida, obviously Texas, they were, they were pretty invasive, but my, my, my point would be is um, I, I agree that you will see a push and pull. I don't know. Um, you know, what the government response is going to be. And I think it's going to vary, as you have said, um, you know, by area and probably probably more outbreak driven this time, maybe than yeah. just general. Hey, what folks, you- come in, go home, you know. Which yeah. I, have, I have one question for you, which is something that people are starting to talk about now. And I think that it's interesting to look at what has been happening in China, because remember way back when and like, the beginning of February, we were talking about the effect of of this on Chinese demand because that's a huge component of the market. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, one of the issues that people have raised is the fact that this thing is spread by close contact, and mm-hmm. one of the places where people get really close contact is public transportation. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we haven't seen those the public transportation being shut down, um, but are people going to? rely less on public transportation and drive more. So are we going to see an increase in demand from that? And I, and, and I wonder, and at least I think some people have been trying to look at preliminary data from China to see whether use of public transportation has decreased and therefore driving is, is up. And I wonder how much of a, how much we could, how, how much would that actually buoy demand in the United States? Right. So I, I've never been to New York City. I've been, I've been to Beijing. So I can tell you about Beijing. <laughs> I've never been to New York, but I have been to Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> well, but like New, York is, New York is relevant. Um, I don't, what, what my point is, ultimately, if, if when you go to Beijing, I'm not sure how many more cars they can put on the road. It is <laughs> wall to wall, like like constant nonstop traffic. So 
you know, maybe a little scooter or a moped, you know, something like that. You'd see those around or maybe a bicycle. Uh, but if you have to travel a long distance, uh, you know, A, can you afford a car? But B, you know, does that change your life so much to where uh, I'm okay. talking a lot of traffic? You know, we got there at uh, I think we got in the bus in the airport like seven o'clock at night or something like that. 8 o'clock at night, 7 30, whatever it was. And it was bumper to bumper from the airport all the way to the hotel. Everywhere we went, it was bumper to bumper. So get, you might say, Yeah, I want to get a car because I don't want to be in public transportation, but that might add on, you know, two, three, four hours of your of your day of just dealing with the traffic and the headache. So um, that'd be one thing to consider. And so to New York City, I would say, I don't know, is there enough parking and stuff like that for people to actually start adding cars? And those are just kind of the questions I don't know the answer to. Yeah. But, um, but New York has said they're going to shut down the subway from one to five to start cleaning Not, it. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, subways can be really gross there. I'm like, I, I don't want to ride the subway at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't imagine a lot of people are. So probably a good move. Probably should have been beforehand. Yeah. Uh, I think a I lot guess, of people are like, wait, you haven't been cleaning the subways right, at all? Right, right, right. Yeah, I've never cleaned them. <laughs> but I guess ultimately what I'm getting is to is I, I do wonder about the increased demand, but on some cities like uh, LA, New York, Beijing, is there really the ability for, um, yeah, that much increase in commuter, uh, you know, personal people driving compared yeah. to public transportation. And I, I don't know that answer, but it, it seems like it might not be, um, as viable unless you start going, like putting office space in the suburbs where people would want to go to, you know, to downtown or yeah. the city. So I don't, I don't know. That's what I wondered about. That's a good question. And I, I, yeah. How much, how much can you, can you actually increase, especially because of the trend in cities has been to like take away lane space for bicycles. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's interesting that you, I, I, your description of Beijing reminded me a lot of the description of Beijing that Ali Al Naimi wrote in his book when he first went to visit Beijing, because back in like the early nineties, he wanted to start selling to Mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he describes going to Beijing and getting at the airport. And like the one, there was like one road to the airport and it was full of people on bicycles. (laughs) <laughs> He's like, how are we going to sell to the, mm-hmm. like, who's mm-hmm. going to buy our oil here? Mm-hmm. And it's just so that like, like to contrast your description mm-hmm. with his description, mm-hmm. your description mm-hmm. now and his description is, yeah. is it, it, it really gives you an incredible sense of, of progress. Oh um, yeah. yeah. And like why Chinese demand is the biggest factor, I think in the market today. Yeah. And what are, you know, um, I've read kind of mixed reports uh, with China. You can almost kind of read the national federal level, if you will, and kind of get a feel of what's going to happen because they have a little bit more control at the top, if you will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a kind way of putting yeah, it. Kind of funny, um, but it feels like there is, um, I was listening to a podcast this weekend, I believe. And, you know, one of the, I guess it was a Chinese national, they're interviewing, I wasn't entirely clear, but she was saying that, that folks are, you know, what you alluded to at the beginning was, you know, being close is what makes it dangerous. But yet to do anything, you have to be close just by the way that the city set up public transportation, going to restaurants, you know, going to eat, you got to take your mask off, you know, you start getting to the, the, the practical stuff. So either uh, if you want to be safe and concerned, you really cut out a lot of normal activity. Uh, and if you want to go out and go to work or whatever, then you have to start compounding the risk. Uh, if you will. And so what, how will they make those decisions? That is, uh, is ultimately going to be the decision, but Ellen, your great state is hosting UFC in your city this weekend. Oh, really? Yes, See, I didn't know that. I'm just yeah. excited that, that the coffee shop I like to go to is, is reopening. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm like more excited to like go get a cup of coffee at a <laughs> coffee shop than like anything. So, <laughs> so. Your, your city is hosting the UFC, they're not letting, it's no live audience, but it's just the yeah. fights. Uh, my, my county um, is battling over, uh, the, the county attorney said that he will not prosecute people who are opening up their businesses because he feels oh. like his job is to do, uh, to, to, to execute justice, not just blindly follow the law. Oh. In, in okay. return, in return, the local judge um, appointed a special prosecutor <laughs> to prosecute those people. I kid you not. I kid you oh not. Oh my God. Could you imagine being, okay. So that reminds me, sorry, another historical reference. That reminds me when, um, like way back when in, in American history, when the British were like, we are instituting the stamp tax where basically mm-hmm. like every mm-hmm. piece of paper had to have a stamp mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. it 
not like a postage stamp, but like yeah, basically yeah, yeah. to say like you pay this extra tax. Right. And everyone was like all up in arms. And Ben Franklin was like quietly trying to apply to be the stamp collector, the stamp <laughs> assessor so that like he could make a ton of money from yeah. this, you know, <laughs> like yeah. who, but, yeah. and then you're like, who wants to be like the stamp tax assessor? Who wants to be the mm-hmm. special prosecutor who prosecutes people for opening yeah. their businesses? Yeah. So, that's, so that's what's going on. Our county attorney said, no, <gasps> the court appointed a special prosecutor. And then the mayor uh, came out and said that he will pull their certificate of occupancy if he finds them out of compliance wow so, so 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 can i just contrast that to what to the press conference that so i had to listen to the press conference from our mayor before the press conference from desantis and, and the president so this press conference from the mayor of jacksonville lenny curry who um they the reporters basically like so how are you planning to enforce because they were talking about reopening like restaurants and having like social distancing and rent and whatever. He's like, so like, how do you plan to enforce this? Like, basically, are you going to send the sheriff? Like, what directives are you issuing to the sheriffs? Uh, he was basically his, his, his answer, not in these words, but this is the essence of it was a lot of people in Jacksonville have guns. So we're not going to yeah. enforce this at all because yeah. I don't want people to get shot. <laughs> I mean, he didn't say anything about guns, but that was basically like, he was like, we think that the people of Jacksonville are very responsible and they've really been very responsible so far. So we don't see any need to like, in, to, you know, enforce this basically saying like, this is what we're saying you should do, but there will be zero enforcement. Like, How any, many cases any- of COVID do you have in Jacksonville? Do you know? Off the top of your um, head? I haven't checked in a while. We have 17. It was very low. 17. 17 in our county. 17 in your county. So our county, Duval County is like the largest county in the yeah. state. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we had like 500 total, like including like nursing. People in the county. We've got 17 cases, two deaths. 17, yeah. So like. So, you know, so, so at least our government's not overreacting here. It's safe to say they're, they're, they're you know, 17 cases. They're, they're definitely on the yeah. right course. So. Yeah. Um, You're like good. more likely to like get hit by a car. I'm more likely to get shot in a shootout between the business owners and the cops. <laughs> my my other favorite one was that massachusetts decided to issue a directive saying that anyone uh, every person uh two years old and older has to wear a mask in public and i wanted and full disclosure i don't i don't have any kids i have spent a lot of time interacting with children however and um i don't know any two-year-old who would like put on a mask or you could get to put on a mask like like did people make this ever meet a two-year-old or no. three-year-old or five-year-old like i don't know about your kids but like no. No. i've got 12 10 five and one yeah the five-year-old uh unless it was a unicorn or something like that but then she'd be wanting to point it out pull it off and show you yeah. look at my unicorn mask you know so yeah you know, even then it wouldn't, it wouldn't my, my other question is okay so i've actually been to places where a lot of people mostly women mm-hmm. um wear uh coverings across their mouths Mm. To restaurants and places like that um have people like thought about what it's the logistics of going to eat at a restaurant with a mask on because mm. well I'm, no. I'm not sure how that's going to work and I've, I've been to places where people cover their mouths yeah in their faces yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's and that's what the lady in china was actually alluding to that the mask if you go out to eat it's no longer effective because you have to take it off to to yeah. eat. And so that, yeah. that was her concern about going out in public was she realized exactly what you're getting to, which is you can't, you just can't wear it for everything. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that people think that this is some kind of like panacea, like that these masks are going to save everyone. It's going to make it possible for us to have normal interactions. And mm-hmm. I think that they, they need to take a step back and like chill out yeah. about the masks. Okay, Miss Wald, yeah. where will you be this week and not talking about masks? Yeah, and not talking about masks. Um, let's see. I'm going to be on investing.com and Forbes and uh, definitely Twitter. So uh, check me out. Okay, Text Along Guys podcast. And I, uh, I will still be. I'm looking, sorry, I'm reading someone respond to Sid and I was trying to see uh, what they were saying. Um, he, he is an interesting follow, if nothing else, the trolls that murky him uh, continually is. Is, uh, is, is, I mean, it, so is, is the meeting, it just uh, to let like, the listeners know, the meeting is going to be televised, live streamable? Uh, it, it has been. I'm assuming it is as, as well. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll put a link to it in the, the show note. Uh, okay. Um, for whatever they're doing, but the last two have been 
have in live stream. So, <gasps> oh, there is one other thing I did want to talk about, actually. Oh, go ahead. We have like two minutes left. Um, so um, one of the interesting things that it seemed like Commissioner Craddock was alluding to was possibly like a future of creating a storage hub in Texas. Uh, mm-hmm. I know she was very careful to say not to rival Cushing, mm-hmm. but um, you only say that if you think that maybe yeah. that's a possibility. Right. So right. that right. could be really interesting to maybe uh, d- a thing to, to think about and to consider. And so um I thought that was a really interesting kind of like drop there at the end that could really yeah. change the dynamics of stuff. Well, it's interesting because uh, the day the price went negative, I think that day or the next day I had probably three to five different groups call me about launching a oil storage business. <laughs> and so mm. oh, they're like, oh, this is what we're going to do. We're thinking about this. And so uh, I know at least one of them is going through the process, trying to get their storage. Now they're not talking about, you know, a hundred million barrels or nothing like that, but just to buy them a couple million barrels or whatever there. Okay. Well, Ellen, uh, it was good. Thanks to commissioner credit for coming on and Nate for setting that up. Appreciate you, Nate. And Hey, you know what? Maybe if getting, you know, if you want to boost, boost Nate's ego, go and leave a five-star review. He will appreciate that folks. He needs a five-star review every now and then. And with that being said, we will talk to you next week. Bye guys. Bye.